Welcome to WGVU's Decision 2012. In this forum, we focus on key local races, meeting with candidates one-on-one, -on -one, discussing the issues. Today, our attention turns to the State House race in Grand Rapids 76th District, where we have reached out to all of the candidates whose names appear on the November 6th ballot. As of this show's recording, Republican State Representative Roy Schmidt has declined our invitation to appear. Now that the housekeeping is in order, we say hello to candidate Winnie Brinks. She is a Democrat running for the seat in the Michigan House of Representatives from Grand Rapids 76th District. How are you today? I'm doing great, thanks. Well, this is a great forum for people to get to know you, and to that end, tell us a little bit, a little bit about yourself. What is the bio? Sure. Um, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a caseworker, and I'm the Democratic candidate for the 76th District, as you said. Um, I have spent the last 20 years or so of my adult life in Grand Rapids here working in schools and nonprofits. I started in community corrections and uh, worked some in schools and most recently as a caseworker at an organization called The Source, uh, working with employees and, and businesses to help them retain those employees. Why get into politics? Why get into politics? Uh, great question. Um, Certainly one of the reasons I'm getting into this race is uh, because I think that Grand Rapids deserves a representative who's going to represent them with integrity. And we weren't seeing that from our uh, current legislator. Um, so that's certainly one thing that got me into this. But another reason that um, I wanted to become more involved is that I have been working with families and students and um, individuals and small groups of people for a long time. Um, helping to resolve barriers to success, seeing what it's like and dealing, helping them deal with the challenges of daily life. Um, and now this gives me an opportunity to work on things like education and workforce training and that kind of thing on a more systemic basis. So I'm um, looking forward to being able to work at that level as well. What, what is your number one issue as you enter into this race? Uh, what, do you, what area, where do you hop up on the soapbox and say that this is where I start my job moving forward. Sure. Um, education is really my first priority. I've been active for the last eight or ten years advocating on issues of K through 12 education and um, helping to promote excellence there and also to make sure that there's adequate funding for our, our kids. I really believe that um, an excellent K through 12 education is really the foundation of our democracy and um, it's good for our economy, it's good for kids, it's the one biggest factor, I think, that opens up opportunities for, for individuals, and um, that's, that's my most important issue. I think that it's to our state's detriment that we have cut education so much, and um, I think it shortchanges our children's future as individuals, but it certainly also shortchanges our, our future as a state. So that's my number one issue. With financial resources limited at the state level, where do you find the money uh, to <laughs> build uh, the education system. Right. Uh, my, the bumper sticker on the back of my car says, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. So I think we need to think about education as an investment in the future of our state at some level. Um, and if we do education right, it will save us a lot of money down the road. Um, it's, it's better to have well-educated kids who get the resources that they need to be successful. Um, than it is to have to try and make up for the lack of those resources later in life when it's much more expensive. So not just academically, but also in terms of job training and um, individuals being able to be self-sufficient. I think that um, we need to make sure that we're making that investment. Where, where, again, where would you find the money to, to, yeah. to fund this? Well, if you want to start talking about um, sort of revenue stream or tax structure. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the most important thing to think about there is that whatever it is, it needs to be fair to all the parties concerned. I think that everybody recognizes that um, taxes are a necessary part of living in community and that, um, you know, they need to be fair. They need to be predictable. They need to be um, uh, something that everybody understands that they are paying their fair share, but that they also get the return on those dollars. So whether that's in education or infrastructure or um, other serv vital services that the government provides, we just need to make sure that we're spreading that tax burden out um, fairly and uh, that everybody is doing their part. An increase in income tax or property tax, where would you try to find a percentage to 
At this point, you know, I mean, we've we've cut different things, these essential services I'm talking about over, you know, a number of years. And as the economy recovers, I think that we can anticipate that revenues will increase. Um, so I'm not talking about raising taxes in any particular way. I'm hoping that as we see the economy improving, we'll be able to to, to bring in more revenue um, through the, the means that we already have set up. Uh, if, if there are problems with our tax structure, certainly be willing to look at that to fix those things. Um, but at this point, I think uh, we need to be looking at priorities of what we fund first as our revenues increase again. And I know seniors are also uh, one of the areas of concern for you. What have you seen uh, with this current uh, administration in Lansing and some of the changes that have been made there as far as, uh, I, I believe, pension and taxes and those types of things? Right. What, do you want to revert to a different system, the old system? What What are you committed to here? Yeah, this, this new tax on seniors, I think, is um, unfortunate. In some ways, I think it's not fair to seniors to kind of spring it on them at the end of, of their careers. Uh, there are many who are not in a position to go back to work and to raise that money. Um, there are some who who can maybe afford it and still be pretty comfortable. Um, but what I am concerned about with the senior tax is the those who can't. And um, sometimes we we don't think very carefully through the ramifications of decisions like that. And we're asking a lot of some very vulnerable people. So. Um, I do have concerns about the senior tax, um, and again, back to making sure that however we're taxing everybody that it is fair and that we're talking to everyone and that everybody's um, contributing their fair share. Well, the economy is a big issue. Right. Uh, jobs, you mentioned education. Mm -hmm. uh, what would your strategy be for growing jobs in this state? Sure. For growing jobs, I think we need to make sure we're supporting businesses, especially small businesses that that provide jobs for over half of our, our employees in the state. Um, we need to do that by trying to make bridges between local banks and credit unions and, and um, businesses so that there is money available for them to, to borrow um, so that they can grow and expand their businesses if that's what they want to do. Um, we also need to make sure that we have a really um, a high skilled workforce that's adequately trained um, starting with a, a solid K through 12 education, but then also connecting those kids with the skills that our workforce um, is required to have for the businesses that we have. So there are lots of, of jobs now in business that require skills that our, our workers don't currently have. So um, I would really like to see us connect those two better. So there's a, a pathway between adequate education and excellent education, additional skills, and those good jobs. So employers need a, a, a skilled workforce. We need to be able to create that skilled workforce. So wherever the government can help make those connections, I think it'd be great for employees and it'd be great for businesses. So those are, those are ways that I would like to see us grow the economy. So attracting and, and, and retaining uh, jobs, how, how do we attract new business into this state? Sure, I think um, a huge concern is infrastructure. We need to be able to assure businesses that, that we have a good infrastructure that's adequate for them to move their goods and services around. Uh, we need, again, touch, touching on the uh, skilled workforce, we need a highly skilled workforce um, for better jobs. Um, businesses need to know that they have the, the skills in uh, the employee pool or the talent pool that will help them build their businesses. Then other things include things like quality of life and, um, you know, safety issues and community issues. So, you know, having um, parks and things like that in pleasant communities, having excellent school systems, having, um, uh, you know, cultural events in, in a, a vibrant downtown. Um, all of those things are important to employees and to businesses when they think, you know, will my employees and will my executive team and will my um, other employees want to live here and stay here? Is this an attractive place for that? So I think all of those things are things we can work on to attract employers. Today we say hello to Democrat Colleen Lamonti. She's running for a seat in the Michigan House of Representatives representing the 91st District. Colleen Lamonti, hello. I'm well. Uh, this is an opportunity for our viewers to get to know the candidates. So for you, a little bit of the bio. Well, um, I'm a teacher. Uh, I teach high school sciences with Muskegon Public Schools. 
Um, I've been married for 18 years, just celebrated my 18th anniversary last weekend. And I've got two children at home, and we live in Montague. Um, we've been here for about five years. I originally grew up on the other side of the state, and we ended up over here because um, my husband lost his job in the automotive industry a few years ago. And because of that, we lost our house to foreclosure. I was a stay-at-home mom at the time, and we ended up moving in with my mom for a year and a half trying to get back on our feet. We were fortunate that my husband found a job in Whitehall, and I was able to find the teaching position with Muskegon Schools. And uh, we love living in the Muskegon County area, so. I didn't hear politics as part of this. So did those trials that your family went through, the foreclosure, your husband losing work, has that led you to a potential career in politics? I think not so much a career in politics, but I think I, I felt the need to, um, to stand up for uh, our middle class right now. I think that my experiences with um, our economy um, having lo you know, having the, the job loss and the home foreclosure and having to relocate, it, this is something that um, I know that a lot of families are dealing with across our state right now and have dealt with. And I think that when I looked around at the people in my community and who I, you know, the, what the, they were dealing with, I felt that we needed to get someone in Lansing who understood the, f you know, the choices and sacrifices that so many families are having to make out here right now. So having that experience, and saying, you know, looking out for the middle class, what are some of the things in particular that you say, these are the items on my agenda that help the middle class, that help people who are struggling? What are they in your mind? I is there a bullet point of one, two, three? Well, I think um, as a teacher, education is near and dear to my heart. And we've seen our education funding uh, dramatically slashed in the last few years. And I have seen the results of that in my classroom and with my students. You know, when you look at the ability of um, our citizenry to go out and apply for good paying jobs, it comes down to do they have the knowledge and skills that they need to be able to do that? And that comes from our public education system. When they have cut the funding the way that they have, I have seen my class sizes increase. I have had uh, less supplies to work with in my classroom, and as a science teacher, I count on some of those supplies to be able to do those hands-on experiments that kids really get into. Um, but we see kids that are starting to fall through the cracks. You have class sizes where there are more kids now, more than ever, that need you know, some additional help, that special one-on-one -on -one attention. And as a teacher, there's only so many minutes in an hour and so much time in a day that you can help out those kids. And when we see those kids fall through the cracks, these are the kids that we're going to end up paying for later on. When you, when you take a look at the state budget and what the legislature has done or proposed in, in recent years, where are the areas where you generate revenue to, to help fund education in this state? Well, when you look at our education funding, they rated our education fund so that they could give away a $1.8 billion tax break to the largest corporations in our state right now. And they said that this is going to bring jobs to our state. And I have not seen those jobs. I've seen this money go out of our state. It's gone to Wall Street. We see, you know, profits that are posted. We see CEO bonuses. But we're not seeing jobs here, and we're not seeing money invested back in our state. We need to get that money back here working for Michigan families. And that's the kind of revenue that we need to be working on. To be fair, do you need time to see if, there, if, the, if this does foster the results of growing business and jobs in the state? Well, we've seen these program, the, the funding cuts, the, the tax breaks for over a year. And over the summer, we saw four months of rising unemployment in our state. So if the jobs were coming, I think we'd see them at this point. I'd like to see us get back to um, some tax incentive programs that were actually working. You know, when you look at our movie and film industry uh, incentive program, we saw movies and jobs that were brought here to our state. And it multiplied throughout our, our communities. When you look at um, uh, the idea that it went through the hotel chains and it went to craft services and all the other things that it went through, Production companies were starting to build um, uh, facilities here in our state so that they could support the movie industry that they were looking to have grow here. And they cut the funding for those programs. I want to see that funding put back in place. 
th that falls in line with the picking winners and losers. Mm -hmm. um, is, that, is that something as part of your platform that, that that's okay, that the state should get involved with subsidizing certain industries? Well, what I'd say to that is that I'd like to pick winners for the Michigan people. We need to get jobs here that you can actually support a family on. You know, when you look at some of the jobs that are in our want ads right now, and it's $8 an hour, $9 an hour, part-time jobs, you can't support a family on this. We need to get jobs in our state you can actually support a family on. So if I'm picking those industries that have those kinds of jobs, yeah, I'm picking winners, winners for the Michigan people. Some people would say, well, you know, we've been involved in alternative energy. That industry is beginning to slow a little bit. We've had the, the uh, lithium ion batteries. We're seeing some issues there where that market's eroding a little bit. And those were industries that were chosen, yeah. I guess. So what areas, where, where would you turn? I mean, is there, is there something more of a, of a broad brush that Lansing can do to attract all businesses? I, is there something out there that you believe needs to be tried? Well, when you talk about you know some of the other alternative energy indus uh, uh, industries, we just saw Muskegon County. We had um, huge turbines that were just shipped in to our port because we have a deep water port there that were made in Germany. Why can't we get that made here in Michigan? If we're going to build these turbines here in Michigan, then let's build the parts that support those turbines. Um, and I think there are areas that we can look at in other industries and manufacturing that we can reach out to and say, you know what, we have a skilled workforce here in Michigan. We have a beautiful state that you would love to raise your family in. Bring your businesses here. Let's have you come here and invest in our state and we're going to give you a tax break for it. Talking about investing in the, in the state infrastructure, uh, key issue, Proposal 6 is on the ballot. Uh, that's that's the, the new international bridge. Yes. Uh, and, the, and the question there is that, you know, the Canadians will finance. Yes. Which is money that the state can then claim to leverage to bring in matching federal dollars. Right. What is your take on, on Proposal 6? Is that a good idea? Well, I absolutely support um, building the second bridge in Detroit. I think that um, we see a lot of money that is being thrown at this ballot initiative, money by one family that owns and controls the one bridge that does exist in Detroit. We need this bridge. I grew up in the metro Detroit area, and when I was 18, the drinking age over in Canada was still 18, and so one of my pastimes was as an 18-year-old to head over to Canada. And it was great going over the bridge. You got off and you're right in the middle of downtown Windsor, which was, you know, great for, you know, going to all the, you know, great hotspots over there. But as a trucker that's trying to get their goods to port, you are in the middle of a, you know, surface street nightmare trying to get your traffic back on the expressway. The new bridge is going to connect directly with the interstate. And we're going to see the lines that we now have reduce dramatically. And what this means for West Michigan is that we have farmers that need to get their perishable produce to their port in a timely manner so that they can increase their profits. If we get the second bridge built, we're going to see that trucking time reduced and they're going to get more of their product to port so that they can get, get it out. The idea that, that schools are somehow, you know, the big corporations would make a profit on the backs of our children is frightening all the Democrats listening right now. They're, you know, that guy's a raving lunatic. I can hear him yelling at their television sets as we speak. Uh, but it's a silly argument. We have, in the state of Michigan, the, uh, the government spends close to $13,000 per student per year to educate kids. And, and people think they understand how the foundation grant works. And no, it's not nearly that much. It's not true. Take up all the money that they get from the federal and, the, and the state, and then the property tax that you pay for the millages and all the rest of it. Add it all up and divide that between the students, and you come to uh, close to $13,000. Muskegon Catholic Central, whose students, 90, more than 90%, go on to college when they graduate, the highest tuition is $6,500. You could cut almost a quarter of the state budget and get better educational outcomes uh, by just giving each student a voucher that they could spend at whatever school they wanted to. 
Uh, it's mind-boggling to me that anybody can argue with this logic. Well, we've got special needs children. This is particularly relevant to parents with children that have special needs. If you could take that money, if, you, if your child is cognitively impaired, you could take that money and put them in, into a Montessori school that's designed for those kind of children. Today, the uh, school teachers complain that they have these students mainstreamed and that I don't understand their problems because I think that Catholic Central is a better, a better school. This is the answer to their problems. Uh, yeah, this is just, yeah, we need to privatize education, <laughs> thank you. You, you mentioned uh, budget cuts there. What, what would your budget priorities be uh, if you became a state representative? What, where, what areas would you look at as core items to the state budget and other areas that you might say, th th these are places that we can make some cuts? Well, I think you could cut just about everything. Government is instituted among men to secure liberty and property. You, obviously, you need to have courts to settle disputes and, and uh, enforce contracts, and you need to have police. This is proper for government to have police departments to, to uh, uh, look for bad guys and put them in jail when they need to be put in jail, and, and the fire departments. And, and uh, at this point, you couldn't privatize roads because you'd never be able to figure out who owned them. But, and so the government needs to, needs to take care of the roads. But I'm hard pressed to find anything else that the government can do better than uh, private, private industry. It, here's another example that, you know, people think, well, the government has to be involved in, in uh, uh, building codes. You scratch your head and most people would say, well, of course they ought to be involved in business, building codes. We've got to have some standards. If you look at it just a little bit differently, what you discover is, is that this is actually a subsidy for mortgage companies and insurance companies. They don't have to go and make sure that you're building your, your property right. In the absence of building codes, what do you suppose would happen? Mortgage companies and insurance companies would set standards that they wouldn't allow their customers to go below, and you'd have a whole bunch of people employed being inspectors that say, I understand these, these standards, all of these companies will work with me, and rather than waiting for the arrogant guy to show up three days after he made the appointment to get your property inspected so you can move on to the next step, you'll have the option of three people that are anxious to make you happy. And the buildings are just as safe as they were before. This is just one example of any number of them that I could give you. Individuals then would have to pay well, yeah, a higher rate pay. The for taxpayers those. are paying for it now. Right. I mean, but you'd pay for it in a different way. Yeah, you'd pay, you'd pay it for it in a different way, and the price would probably be lower because there'd be competition. <laughs> you know, there'd be there'd be multiple uh, outfits out there that could that would be qualified to come and inspect your construction project. Uh, I don't see how the. I, it, to me, it just makes sense that the, the world's a lot better place now. You mentioned police, fire the essentials of most municipalities. Uh, revenue sharing has been an issue for years now. The, the cuts that locals have taken over the years after sending money to Lansing and what they get back is not the best return on investment. Um, would you shift uh, the way that revenue sharing is conducted? Or would, if you could, would you try to do away with it uh, completely? I think I'd be inclined, and I'm not sure how they do it in Texas, but the state of Texas manages to get by with a 6% sales tax. All their government is funded by that 6% sales tax. They have an excise tax on some of the oil that they sell. The schools aren't any worse in Texas. There aren't any more murderers and muggers in Texas than there are here. Uh, uh, the roads are every bit as nice, uh, and the unemployment rate is lower, and they don't have any silly signs saying this is a cool city. Um, the uh, revenue sharing, I suspect that what ought to be done is, is that if you can run the government on a 6% sales tax, that you should say that the tax that's generated in any given municipality, uh, a certain portion of that stays in that municipality. It's fair. You still have property tax in Texas, too, and so the municipalities would be able to operate their functions on the, on the property tax. Health care. I know where you're going to come from on this one, <laughs> but uh, in, the, in the state, uh, you know, the state has, is supposed to be setting up these exchanges right now. Um, under the current system and the early stages of the new system, some people call it Obamacare, 
What is the impact on the state, and how do you think the state should be dealing with this? Um, at this point, I think the state ought to not set up the exchange and hope for a repeal. And if the Republicans don't are not able to repeal it, I think that the state should stand on the on the Tenth Amendment and refuse to enact it. Uh, it's just a really, really bad idea. Um, People tell me all the time about the wonderful health care system in, in Canada. And I was living in Portland, Maine many years ago and uh, sitting in a tavern uh, trying to interject myself into the conversation of some pretty girls sitting at the next table. And when I heard them say the Canadian wing of the hospital, my curiosity was naturally piqued. And so I asked them, what could you possibly be talking about? Portland, Maine is a seven hour drive from the Canadian border no matter which direction you take. There's no place in Canada that's closer to Portland, Maine than Toronto. Why would a Canadian come to the United States to get health care? Well, it turns out if you're actually sick in Canada, you can't find a doctor or a specialist to take care of you because they're all busy taking care of people with sniffles or that are pregnant or that need to get a doctor's excuse from work. And they have to limit them because it's a state budget, a, a, you know, a national budget item. They say, well, this is how much money we have for, for whatever there is. Uh, this is a really, really bad idea. When I, when I was working in Germany, I said to a fellow there many, many years ago, uh, so it must be nice to not have to worry about buying health insurance and, and uh, all the rest of that. And, you know, he said to me, yeah, but you still want to get private insurance. I said, really, why? Well, because you can get taken care of. In the last minute here, uh, for those who might be on the fence, not sure who to vote for, uh, a final appeal. Um, please, just vote your conscience. There isn't any reason to think that there's a whole lot of difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. And even if I don't win, they're more likely to take your liberty seriously if you vote Libertarian. Thank you. All right. We'd like to thank Libertarian Nick Sunquist. You're running for state representative in Michigan's 91st district. Thank you for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. And thank you for tuning into WGVU's Decision 2012.